Good evening. I'm Molly Duffy, and I'm the Executive Director of the Valley Forge Park Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the second event in our 2021 speaker series, sponsored by the Sharon H. and Bruce A. Bakke Foundation. Since we have several presenters and panelists this evening, I recommend that you put your Zoom session in speaker view. There's an icon in the upper right portion of your Zoom screen that should allow you to toggle between speaker view and gallery view. Speaker view is, distract is less distracting as it allows you to see only who's currently presenting. There's also a Q&A chat during our Zoom webinar that can be used to submit your questions. The Q&A chat icon is on the bottom portion of your Zoom window. Feel free to use the Q&A chat anytime during the event. Now I would like to introduce our moderator. Susan Falciani Maldonado is the Special Collections and Archives Librarian at Tre Trexler Library, Muhlenberg College. She works with students in and outside the classroom to increase their primary source literacy using Special Collections materials. She's particularly interested in the use of college history as a lens through which students can examine historical events, culture, and society. Additionally, she's responsible for exhibits, outreach initiatives, collections, collections maintenance and processing, and digital projects. Susan holds a bachelor's degree in history from the College of William and Mary, and a Master of Library and Information Science degree from Rutgers University. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Molly. Um, I am delighted to be here this evening um, to have the opportunity um, to serve as the moderator uh, for this book. Um, when I, the opportunity arose for me to, uh, me to be involved this evening, I was so excited, not because I'm necessarily an expert in the Muhlenberg family, um, but because I am hoping to be, and I'm engaged in several projects that I'm hoping will make some resources that Muhlenberg College holds related to the Muhlenberg family, including General Muhlenberg, uh, more accessible uh, for researchers um, and for the public. And actually, it's something that we're hoping to uh, start a crowdsourcing project that others can be involved with as well. And so very graciously, um, our um, organizers this evening have allowed me to share one or two slides just to give you a little bit of an idea of the nature of, of some of that projects and the holdings that, that Muhlenberg College has related to um, the Muhlenberg family. So, so we're in possession of a large collection of family papers. There's about 4,000 pages in total, um, 1,900 unique items. And these are materials that have been held by the college um, since 1976. Um, the content is largely related to um, primarily two individuals. Um, there are papers, and I have an example here actually of something written by General Pete. Um, You'll hear me colloquially refer to him that way because he's kind of an unofficial mascot of our library. So he's somebody that we mentioned and we talk about a lot. Um, but we do have a few um, pieces from some of the primary original members of the Muhlenberg family, including Henry Melchior Muhlenberg, the, um, the patriarch of the family, um, and several uh, individual pieces from some of that first generation of the sons but most heavily um, what the collection involves is the papers of um, Henry Augustus Philip Muhlenberg, who was a, a congressman and the first ambassador to uh, Austria, to Vienna. And also his son, um, who actually is the author, who I believe um, Mike will be mentioning this evening, um, who wrote the first biography, The Life of Major General uh, Muhlenberg. And there's a lot of really amazing family material um, in, involved in there from various members. Of, of course, it's a vast family tree. Um, this material has been digitized. Um, in the seven years that I've been at Muhlenberg, I knew that I wanted to do things with these papers, but I just, so I had student workers scan them and there's metadata that has been completed on them. But in terms of really making them searchable and accessible to researchers, uh, we're not quite there yet. And so it just so happens that over the next few years, we've prepared a project um, that we hope will involve really getting some intellectual control over the content of those papers that will then make them um, make them more uh, accessible to researchers. Um, content 
just from what we know, um, there was a hotly contested uh, gubernatorial election in Pennsylvania in 1835 that um, Henry Augustus Philip Muhlenberg participated in and it devolved into splitting the party and it was the wolves, it was Governor Wolf and the wolves and the mules. So there's a whole, whole area around that. But really there's a, so much content um, written by women in these collections about children, about housekeeping, about political affairs, about um, the ambition of their husbands and whether they should make certain choices in terms of their careers. Um, so there's, there's a lot of content to be examined from social and cultural angles, um, as well as the political content. Uh, we're hoping um, to be awarded a, a grant um, in the coming year that will allow professional archival processing of the collection so that we'll be able to create a finding aid in the, that first wave of traditional access for researchers. But in the more near term, we're in the process of putting together a crowdsourcing transcription project uh, that we hope to be launching um, in December. And uh, that is something that anyone on this call or we are hoping for students and alumni, it's, it's gonna be a long winter and we're not supposed to be going out a lot. So this is something that I hope that the historically minded among us might get a kick out of. Um, and ultimately, once we have established more intellectual control over the collection, we hope to, and I've spoken with some of these institutions, try to create a portal of some kind that will bring together access to Muhlenberg family material that's held at other institutions, largely in Pennsylvania. And so I'm going to stop talking now, but I just wanted to share that if anybody is interested in that crowdsourcing project, I will be sharing that on our different social media um, accounts here. And if you'd like to email me to find out more about it, you are welcome, of course, to do that too. And as I said, his face appears all over as we had our, our, our mask uh, masking mandate um, across campus this year. So I am going to stop sharing. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, historian Michael Sashir is a high school history teacher, an avid Revolutionary War reenactor, and a prolific author on Virginia during the American Revolution. Mike was recognized by the Virginia Society of the Sons of the American Revolution as their 2005 Outstanding Teacher of the Year. He's a former president of the Board of Directors for Historic Dumfries, Virginia, Inc and he travels around the country delivering talks on the American Revolution. His scholarship has deepened our understanding of the Southern campaigns of the war, particularly as it played out in Virginia in 1781. Sashir has written uh, 16 books and multiple articles exploring military history of the American Revolution. In 2017, the Journal of the American Revolution published Mike's book, The Invasion of Virginia, 1781. This volume clarifies an oft neglected campaign and makes sense of a confusing period of the Virginia Continental Line service during the war. His most recent book, released in June, follows the life of General Peter Muhlenberg. So with that, I'll get us started, Mike, by just asking, so why General Muhlenberg? Why, why this book? Um, first, thank you, Susan, for the introduction. And, and, and I want to uh, thank, the, um, thank everyone for having me here. Uh, why Muhlenberg, you ask? That's a great question. Um, honestly, General Muhlenberg, Peter, or actually John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, was a man who seemed to fit in two locations. You know, I, I came across him a lot uh, in my research on Virginia, but uh, he seems to be more of a Pennsylvanian. Um, and he was a big mystery to me. But he was also one of Virginia's four brigadier generals during the revolution. And um, what, what I did is I've been writing now for almost 20 years. And um, when I finally came and looked at him as a potential topic, I, I noticed that really there hadn't been anything uh, in the last 100 years, 150 years um, of note about this man. Um, whenever I pick a topic, I, I do it primarily because I want to learn more about him myself, it myself. So um, that's what happened there. I started to dig a little bit. Then I had to decide whether there was something, there was a story there, and there sure is. There's a great story with General Muhlenberg. Um, and so off to the races I went. And uh, I'm proud to say now we've got between uh, myself, Dr. Harry Ward out of Richmond, um, he produced a couple of biographies um, on General George Whedon and General 
Charles Scott, and then I did William Woodford, and then I went off and did Muhlenberg. So we've got all the brigadiers covered now, um, at least for a generation or so. Um, and so that's, you know, there's just, I, I've got this passion to share. I think it's the educator in me. I just, I want to learn myself and then I want to share it with folks. And I think General Muhlenberg, uh, the service he gave to the, to the country, not only in the war, but also in politics later on, which I really don't write about because I focus, I'm, a, I'm a more of a military historian, but he definitely deserves to be remembered. And that's, so that's why I'd say I wrote the book. Should I go on with the presentation? Yes, please do. Okay, I'm gonna to go to share screen now and tell you all about what I learned about him. So, I've been doing this now for several months, so you think I would be flawless at it. All right, here we go. John, General John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you can all see the, uh, the different images there. There's a, on the left is my book. Um, this is from a, this painting is from an unknown artist uh, that I believe is at the uh, Muhlenberg College. But this is the one I really wanted to highlight to start the show because uh, basically I, I would guess that this is probably the best representation of what General Muhlenberg looked like um, of everything we have out there. We're certainly not the cover of my book. Uh, I don't know where the publishers got that, but but this right here, this is a John Trumbull, uh, the, the the John Trumbull painting of uh, the surrender at that at um, Yorktown. So believe it or not, I I, was, I had to do a double check, check and I'm not 100% positive, but the source I was looking at to kind of identify all these figures told told me that this is uh, General Knox, who I was always led to believe was a little heavier than that. Of course, maybe five years or eight years six years on the on the campaign might have slimmed him down a little bit and the other gentleman i believe is general edward hand another uh, a pennsylvanian um uh, officer at valley I, mean, I keep saying valley forge i mean uh, yorktown so there's you, you notice it, it one of the things we were talking about before the program began uh is the, the detail on that painting and it, to me it jumps out um i'm, I'm guessing that the, the artist had a had seen General Muhlenberg. I mean, the nose, the eyebrows and all that, the chin, those are pretty distinctive. That's not a generic face like we so often see it at, in uh, paintings of that time period. Okay, well, let's talk about um, General Pete as he was referred to. Uh, he was born in, in Trapp, Pennsylvania, uh, 1746, the first son of uh, a Lutheran minister, Henry Muhlenberg, who himself deserves his own biography. Um, unfortunately, I don't know a lot about about the gentleman, just uh, what I've come across in my research on his on his son. But um, the whole family is is a sensational family to study and to explore. Um, and so we're talking about I'm, I'm not I, I'm in Williamsburg, Virginia at the moment uh, this is where I live. So I'm not that familiar with anything outside of Valley Forge. I do know every time I go up there, I get totally lost. <laughs> but. Um, you see where Trap is in Valley Forge, there's Philadelphia. I couldn't tell you where Valley Forge is on this, but I know that I know they're about 30, maybe 35 miles up, away from each other in Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, now, what I want to talk to you about, I've got some quotes that I, I think I'm going to have you read as I read them out loud too, because there's some pretty fascinating um, quotes. Uh, so Muhlenberg's the first son, uh, the, the information I get, and a lot of my uh, early source, you know, there's very limited sources early on in his life. Uh, they come from the biography that a great nephew wrote, uh, Henry Augustus Muhlenberg wrote in, in, or published in 1849. Um, you always got to take those kind of sources with a grain of salt, of course. Uh, what they're really good for, though, are, is the primary source material, the letters, as long as, I mean, they're not perfect because they're not usually the, the letters, of course not. But you hope that they haven't uh, they haven't transcribed them in a way that that twists the history too much. Uh, but what what um, the nephew or the great nephew talks about is Henry grew up as a kind of a, a kid that loved the outdoors. You know, he did all the things that you'd expect a boy on the on the edge of the frontier would would do: hunting, fishing, and all that. Um, but I think what's really neat is when they moved. They uh, um, his father was a leader, the leader of the Lutheran Church in Pennsylvania. Um, 
and he moves to Philadelphia when when Peter is 14 or so. And uh, you get this letter soon after that, uh, soon after they move. I think it was 1760 when they moved to Pennsylvania at 14. Now Peter's 16. And I want you to read this letter because it's quite, a, I mean, every parent can, I can relate. I write in great anxiety. This is the father writing about Peter now. I write in great anxiety on account of the corruption among the impudent and emancipated youth of this city, Philadelphia. And I am not able to provide for his welfare, Peter's welfare any longer. It would be a great scandal and offense in my position and to the ruin of his soul if he should fall into wild ways. Is there not an opportunity among the members of your church for him to learn surgery or even an honest trade? Now he's writing uh, uh, to, to uh, individuals across the ocean in Europe and England uh, when he writes this letter, but he's looking for help to kind of tame his, his wild son who um, is starting to kind of get unmanageable and all that. And what results from that is an apprenticeship in, uh, in uh, Lubeck, Germany. Um, it's, it's a kind of a twisted story and, the, and his younger brothers go over there too um, and they actually get to go to school, but I guess it's time for um, Peter to learn a trade. And, and so he's, he goes along willingly. He's all for this. He's going to actually learn. This is going to be his uh, life now. And somewhere along the line, he seems to think he equates being a grocer with being a druggist. I guess they, were, they went hand in hand, um, much like today, right? You go to the grocery store, you got the pharmacy right there. And that, so that's what he, that was his destiny, so to speak. But and, and he signs a six-year indenture. So for six years, he's going to work under this. He's going to be under the kind of care of a, of a druggist. I'm sorry, I should say a grocer in Lubeck, uh, Lubeck I believe is how you say it, um, Germany. But what he finds instead is disappointment. Disappointment. And he's there for almost two years before anybody um, in his family or, or some of the guardians looking out for him um, kind of indirectly start to realize that this situation was not how it was originally intended or uh, presented. And so this is a letter. Um, I don't know how to say the gentleman's name that he writes to, but uh, this is a letter that Mueller writes after inquiries um, about how he was doing. And so this is what he writes. Uh, read it. Um, just listen carefully. I consented, I consented joyfully to the six years because at the time I had a great fancy for business. But as it has turned out quite differently, I leave it to your honor's opinion if six years are not too many. And that is a long indenture um, or apprenticeship, I should say. It really, it, it is really true that last winter I was obliged to wear one shirt for from four to six weeks because I only had two and because my clothing was very bad and we had to stand the whole winter long in an open shop and I was obliged to suffer from the cold. All right, and so there's there's more in my book. There's more detail. Apparently, he didn't get along uh, with the with the mistress of the household, um, and and so there was a little tension there too. Um, but this next part, this is a continuation of the letter. I know it's a lot, but it, it's so it's such great stuff. I I just had to share it. Your honor knows very well that there is not much to be learned in a grocery store, and I assure you that when I had been here four weeks, I knew as much as I do now. This is two years later. Two years later. For when I learned how to pour out a glass of brandy and to sell a little tea, sugar, et cetera, I had learned everything. All right, I won't read, I won't, um, read the bottom part, but what he basically says is that the, um, the man in charge, the, the shopkeeper, he does all the, uh, the dispenses all the drugs. And so pure, poor Peter's not learning any of that part of the trade. All right. So what's happening is now that the authority, so to speak, or the, his guardians are aware that he's upset, the uh, process of uh, kind of renegotiation began, and uh, a deal is struck where they're going to shorten his um, his stay, his apprenticeship by by two years. And um, and Peter's father agrees to pay something. I, I don't. I'm not sure what the currency it was. German currency. But he's going to pay a hundred dollars of it uh, in order to compensate the um, um, grocer. And then after all that's settled and everything's kind of calmed down bam, Peter runs away. And when I mean run away, I mean, he basically just leaves the shop. And then he writes a letter to the man explaining why he did it. And it's a very curious letter. He says, my dear Herr ne Nehemiah, you will be not a little vexed when you hear that I have gone away so unexpectedly. I think he left at three o'clock in the morning. You have done your very best for me and it is not your fault. 
It is partly owing to my love for my native country. And uh, this is the really interesting part. And the other reasons I cannot disclose to you. What could those be? I don't know. You know, he basically says that everybody likes to just kind of ex just assume, oh, he was homesick. He was homesick. He certainly wasn't happy um, in that position. But there's something else, something big that he, that he can't talk about. Um, and, and it's just very curious. I have enlisted as a cadet among the Englishmen who are going uh, into garrison in America. I now humbly entreat you not to injure yourself and, you know, please accept it. It's done. So he joins the 60th Royal American Regiment who are recruiting in Germany and they're going to, they're going to go to garrison duty in, in, um, in Pennsylvania, in, in, I should say in the colonies. And so basically he joins up um, and becomes a secretary and uh, then cut, gets, you know, sails over to America and all that. And as soon as he gets to Pennsylvania, he's discharged. That's it. That's, that's the extent of his military service. And that's kind of an important point to kind of uh, put away for a second, because I'll come back to that. Um, now, I'm going to tell you one more thing. I'm going to, I'm going to pause for a bit for some questions, but his father's reaction is classic. When his father finds out that his son, who what, might, must be 18 or 19 now, has gone and done this, read, look at this reaction. I see today, the 9th of December, with sorrow, that my eldest boy has allowed himself to be overcome by the world of the flesh and the devil and gone headlong into destruction. It mortifies and bows me to the ground with shame. If my boy had played me this trick here and enlisted, I would have sold him as a servant until his majority, 21, and have put him in the house of correction. Ooh, that's Pastor Muhlenberg, very angry in 1776. Luckily for Peter, when he gets there, his father forgives him, pays uh, whatever, uh, whatever expenses he has, gets him discharged from the army, and then takes him back into the family. And then, and before you know it, Peter's off and running with the church. Um, and it really does find his calling in the church. Um, and so I'm going to pause right here now. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time, and I don't know. Okay, it looks like we're doing pretty good for time, but if there are any questions, um, um, this would be there there are not right now, but I would like to encourage the audience, if you do have questions, we're going to pause like this a few times throughout the talk. And Mike is happy to kind of answer as things come up. So I definitely encourage you to, to put questions into the Q&A chat and we'll, we'll stop and, and answer them as they come. So, and we're doing great on time. Excellent. All right. So what happens now is um, apparently um, Peter Muhlenberg is a natural. He's just a natural speaker, and he, he becomes uh, almost somewhat of a sensation in, in, in that area of, of Pennsylvania. And he marries uh, Henry, uh, he marries a, a potter a potter a potter's daughter Hannah Meyer. And um, then what happens is uh, a gentleman from Virginia, from the Shenandoah Valley, where there's quite a few German settlers passing through makes inquiries of anybody, any, any minister in the area that would be interested in tran um, transferring to Virginia who could speak both English and German. They're looking for a bilingual minister. And word reaches um, Muhlenberg, Peter Muhlenberg, and he's interested in this. This is an opportunity to have his own parish and, and such, but there's a catch. They want, in Virginia, of course, there, uh, basically there's no freedom of religion. There is a state religion, it's the Anglican church. And so um, it would make, although there's quite a few Lutherans in the Shenandoah Valley, the Anglican church is still essentially an arm of the government that there. So to make life easier for all of them, they want, they want um, an ordained minister of the Anglican church. Well, Peter Muhlenberg agrees to go over to England and do whatever he has to do there uh, in London to be ordained by the church. And then he returns to, uh, to the colonies. And before you know it, he's moving down the old wagon road to Dunmore, and you see right here, um, uh, Dunmore County today, it's called Shenandoah, and, he's, and he moves into Woodstock. Now, th this is a recreated uh, kind of frontier church uh, that you might find. The, the actual church doesn't exist anymore, but the site of the church, there is a, an Episcopal uh, Paleo church sitting there now. Um, and of course, he has a parish, so there's going to be, I think, six or eight, maybe eight churches in all that he, that he, he rides the circuit and all. But you see where he is. He's up in Northern Virginia um, um, in, in what was then called Dunmore County. Um, okay, what happens? He is a hit. He is just, a, uh, again, I'll call him a sensation. 
very respected uh, clerg clergyman, becomes a justice of the peace, which is uh, was a very interesting um, kind of step, you know, a magistrate, so to speak. Uh, and then when all the political disruption uh, occurs uh, in 74, 75, you know, the intolerable acts and the reaction to the crackdown on Boston, he ends up being the chairperson of the county committee. He's two years transplanted. Now, I suppose there are a lot of transplants in Dunmore County, so maybe maybe you don't have kind of a prejudice against these newcomers the way uh, some communities might. But nevertheless, that's 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 a meteoric rise, you know, to uh, to a very respected position. So he's now on the uh, county committee, chairing the county committee that's dealing with Dunmore County's reaction to the intolerable act. Okay. Um, he also chairs the Committee of Safety because, you know, after when the first Continental Congress meets, they basically uh, uh, come up with a boycott and then all the counties are supposed to impose that. And so there he is. He's, he's mixing politics with religion, which actually causes a little bit of stress among uh, with his brother, his younger brother, um, and perhaps even his father. I, I'm not sure about the father, but back home, they don't think you should be mixing the two. Okay. In 75, Virginia starts holding, um, well, the they held one in, in 74, but they hold these a series of special conventions. And each county sends two representatives to them because the, uh, the legislature has been disbanded by the governor Dunmore. And so Muhlenberg is picked to go to the second and the third and the fourth, and he probably would have been picked to the fifth, but by then he had been picked to be um, a colonel in the new kind of regular army that Virginia is raising. So, <laughs> Oh my God, so now all of a sudden this, this guy, 29 years old, just 29 years old, and he is now a colonel in the, um, in the Virginia regular forces. And it's a special unit. It's called the German Regiment. Now don't, be, don't misunderstand that because they're not all German soldiers there. There are quite a few German speaking soldiers there, but there are also quite a few Irish soldiers or English speaking um, soldiers in there too. So he's gonna command this. I'm fascinated at, that, at this decision because his military experience is pretty, pretty limited. Um, uh, his stature is, is big, but he's only, again, he's only been around for a couple of years um, and yet he gets command. And uh, now we, we head toward probably the most famous incident amongst uh, a lot of folks at least, and that is the farewell sermon. Okay, so let's, let's, let's work on the, Oh, let me pause for a second before I get into the details of this. Uh, I'll ask if there are any other questions. Any questions pop up so far? Uh, yes, we did have one that was okay. kind of right after your last pause. Yep. Um, someone would like to know, why was he discharged from the 70th when reaching America? 60th. Um, 60th, sorry, um, don't say 60th. I don't know. It wasn't, there was no problem with it at all. That's a great question, really, um, how, how they let him go like that. Um, I don't, I don't really have an answer to that. I, I don't know why um, he was able to kind of wrangle out of it. I, I, I mean, he was kind of brought in as, when you're a cadet, you're considered kind of a student. You know, we did the same thing. I, I know um, um, James Monroe, I believe, was a cadet early in the in the war, you know, future president. And then and then you, you rise to the rank of an ensign, and then you rise to the rank of a lieutenant. So perhaps he was viewed more as a volunteer than a um, because you know than uh, an actual in, in, enlisted he, he wasn't enlisted anyway not like a regular soldier he was right off the bat put in with the officers or amongst the officers probably because he 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 had had a good pen I'm, I'm guessing he could write so that would be my answer my educated guess at that one all right let's talk about the farewell sermon so there are all kinds of variations of this and and uh, and so. Uh, and I'm probably gonna step on some toes here uh, if I have any Muhlenberg fans, but I feel pretty confident in, in my, my account. So um, when you look at this, the, the story goes like this, that uh, General Muhlenberg is appointed to the 8th Virginia. And this is in um, pretty much early January, 1775, no, six. Yeah, 1776 now. And there's already been fighting here in Virginia. And of course, in April of uh, 75, there was Lexington Conference. So he's been appointed to command. He rides from Williamsburg back to Dunmore County, which has got to take him a week in the wintertime, especially to get there. Um, so he gets there and, you know, as Colonel, he's kind of in charge of overseeing recruitment. Now I'm going to tell you the story first, and then I'm going to tell you what really happened. So the story is when he gets back there, 
he basically kind of, uh, lets everybody know that he's joining the army or he's kind of command of the regiment and he's going to hold his one last sermon uh presumably in woodstock the town that there's kind of the center where the where his um residence was the main church was and so they the the day of the sermon comes and the place is packed and he shows up with his ministerial robe and he gives this uh this this gripping sermon and uses a reference of, out of the bible um i'll actually use the uh, the the quote because the, i don't i don't dispute the quote um i get this again from um henry muhlenberg's biography of his of his great uncle uh this is what he wrote that in the language of holy writ there was a time for all things a time to preach and a time to pray but those times had passed away that there was a time to fight and that time had now come all right so i don't dispute that that muhlenberg may have said that i i, I think there's a lot of support for that what i dispute is the timing of it and then the next day rips off his robe and underneath it is a uniform uh, perhaps some, some some accounts say sword others don't but he's got his uniform and then because of that speech 300 men signed up right there now the reason this is kind of not likely is a couple of things first and this is kind of a minor point really the uniform he's wearing is not going to be the general's uniform that you're going to see him in throughout most of the war when he becomes a general because he's a colonel in the 8th Virginia. And at that point in early 76, they're all wearing hunting shirts, even the officers. Even the officers are wearing hunting shirts, but that's a minor point. More importantly is the recruitment. He's got um, a regiment made up of 10 companies coming from, I think, eight different counties. And each company is gonna have 68 men and the co company captains and the lieutenants are appointed by those counties to raise their men. And that's, in fact, they have quotas. And if they don't meet the quota, they don't get to be captain and lieutenant. So the colonels aren't involved in any of that. Not only that, but um, these guys are spread out over literally a couple hundred miles when you when you count it all up. And so there's no way you're going to get them all gathered there that early in. I, I rely on um, Dr. James Thatcher's journal, which was published in 1823, in which he basically um, pr provides an interesting quote that I think is pretty much the first reference, the first reference to uh, this incident. So I'm gonna read you what he writes. Yeah, there was a little officer soiree going on, and this is where I think Thatcher first learned about this. He said, he, he describes General uh, Muhlenberg in this, in this account. Uh, General Muhlenberg was a minister of a parish in Virginia, but participating in the spirit of the times, exchanged his clerical profession for that of a soldier. Having in his pulpit incul inculcated uh, the principles of liberty and the cause of his country, he found no difficulty in enlisting a regiment of soldiers, and, was, and he was appointed their commander. He entered his pulpit with his sword and cockade, preached his farewell sermon, and this is the part I think that supports my view. And the next day marched at the head of his regiment to join the army. And he does honor to the military profession. So here's what I think happened. In January and February, all those officers from those different counties were out recruiting men. And they were all, and, and a lot of them, the, the ones closest to Dunmore County decided to march to Woodstock. And then from there, they would all march on to Suffolk, which is in Southeast Virginia. There were a number of the county companies that it was that would be out of their way, so they just went right to Suffolk. So then I think Muhlenberg probably gave his farewell sermon sometime in March, right before he marched out to, uh, to the muster point in Suffolk. Um, to support that, we have uh, records of him still baptizing babies uh, over the winter before he leaves. So that's, you know, the, the sermon survives. That's the good news. The story's still largely intact. It's just some of the details have been switched around a little bit. And that's a kind of a, you know, big deal to a lot of people who for years have thought is, oh, they, they, they have the date up here, I think in January, like 21st or something like that. All right, so there's my slide. This is what I should have showed you while I was talking about this, but I got into it so much. There's the, this is the statue in front of the uh, courthouse there. This is one of many images of him. You see the regimental coats that he's wearing. The robe apparently, this is apparently the robe that he wore, although I'm not a very good at, as, at artifacts as, as some, so I, I, I can't really attest to that. So what happens? He goes off to war. He's with the 8th Virginia. They muster in Suffolk down uh, 
pretty much on near the border of North Carolina. Um, he, he then uh, when the British kind of direct uh, a force down toward Charleston in 1776, General Charles Lee shows up. Um, now Charles Lee is, uh, is is widely considered one of the best commanders in the of the American Army because he's a, he's an experienced British general. And what happens is. Um, he comes to Williamsburg for a few weeks, and then when he realizes the British are heading toward the Carolinas, he marches down to North Carolina. Well, he takes the 8th Virginia because that's the kind of the most prepared unit, um, and off they go. Now, they're not supposed to be. They're not, con well, they are continental soldiers, but they're not really supposed to be leaving Virginia yet. But the 8th goes anyway, because uh, General Lee ordered them to, and they end up at the Battle of Charlestown. Now, this is the first one. And I have the wrong date on my slide. I just realized that. I should say 1776, not 1775. Um, so in this, in this battle, really the heroics are right here at Fort Moultrie. Where's, there it is. Right here. Um, uh, it's now called Fort Moultrie. Back then it was on just Sullivan's Island. Palmetto Log Fort that absorbed a lot of the British Navy's uh, artillery uh, cannon fire. Um, Muhlenberg's men were stationed over here expecting some sort of land attack, but the British, sorry, the, the British uh, land forces were stuck on this island. Ah, my thing keeps moving. Were stuck uh, on an island. They couldn't cross this inlet. They were misinformed. They thought at low tide they could cross what's called the breach inlet, and they couldn't. So they just sat this whole thing out. So bottom line is, uh, at the Battle of Charleston, the 8th Virginia doesn't play a, a, a significant role but they do end up crossing over near the end of the day and reinforce, reinforcing the troops right over here um, that are guarding the backside of Sullivan's Island. Okay, good news is the British give up in Charleston, head back uh, north, and the 8th Virginia then goes with Charles Lee to Georgia, and there's an effort to start a mount an, an expedition, maybe even against East Florida, um, but that kind of uh, peters out when um, General Lee is ordered north to join Washington in New York because that's where all the action is going to be. Um, and what happens is eventually the 8th Virginia, they kind of return back to Virginia in a couple of detachments and they are shattered. They're just a mess. Um, I think General, um, I should say Colonel Muhlenberg also contracts malaria while he's down in the south, down in probably in Georgia. And that's going to kind of be a problem for him for the rest of his life, really. So he returns to Virginia, is at home, um, trying to re restore the 8th Virginia. They've shrunk down. They should have a force of 700 men um, when they're fully um, manned. They're down to about, I think, 170 effective men. A lot of, um, they, and most of them haven't died or anything. They're just sick or they're just deserted. Some of them have deserted. Okay, so over the uh, late winter, early spring, word comes to Muhlenberg that he's been promoted to Brigadier General. Wow. Why? What? Again, that's a, that's to me that's just an amazing thing, and it didn't take long to figure out why. It's it's nothing. You don't get promoted back then uh, on on a for meritorious service, so to speak. He got promoted because it was basically his turn. Uh, because what had happened is, um, as the Virginia line got bigger and bigger, they needed they you know they needed more generals, so they needed four brigadier generals, and. It turned out that you know the colonels of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, a couple of them had already been promoted, like Hugh Mercer and Adam Stevens, um, and and several of them had um, quit or resigned for whatever reasons. So the eighth Virginia was the next in line, and he at least he, the colonel of the eighth, was the next in line in terms of um, of uh, supremacy there, and so he became the highest ranking brigadier general. Um, among the four brigadiers in the Virginia in the Virginia line, okay. So he commands the first, fifth, ninth, and thirteenth Virginia regiment. All right. So he goes up and joins the um, American Army. Now they 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 had gotten through Trenton and Princeton um, uh, and all that, and then survived their first winter around um, you know Morristown and and the the hills outside of there. And now it's the um, fall campaign because General Howe just wastes the whole summer. And uh, there's a lot of marching uh, back and forth across New Jersey. But basically, we've got two significant battles that Muhlenberg and his men are involved with, the Battle of Brandywine and the Battle of Germantown. Now, neither, I, don't th I wouldn't say Muhlenberg plays a decisive role in either one, although Muhlenberg's regiment, I should say brigade now, brigade, remember, four regiments, 
was his brigade and uh, was General George Whedon's brigade made up General Nathaniel Green's division. And they kind of came to the rescue on the right wing. I'm not sure how, much, how, how, how well you are all familiar with the Battle of Brandywine, but basically the British army flanked the American right. They, they marched around, they held them in position, they marched around. And uh, as the American right flank was collapsing and they, they fought pretty well for a while, but they eventually couldn't hold back. Um, that's when General Green's two brigades, Whedon and Muhlenberg showed up. Now, I, I, we all know Mule, uh, Whedon was there. There's great uh, um, sources for Whedon. Muhlenberg's brigade, uh, there's some people that claim he, he wasn't there, but that doesn't make any sense. I, I just, I don't understand why he wouldn't have been there. So I'm, I'm assuming he was there, but he didn't, he didn't get into the heaviest of the fighting. Um, but again, that's something that could be explored in more detail down the road. Uh, Battle of Germantown, he's still with General Green's uh, um, division. Uh, they show up late because they get lost, remember? Um, if you remember uh, the 9th Virginia, when I showed you the regiment he had, I showed you the 9th. The 9th Virginia Regiment is the regiment that actually advanced the farthest in the American attack, and virtually the entire regiment got captured because of that. Um, so, so there was plenty of fighting there for General uh, Muhlenberg. So what happens next is Valley Forge. Um, I'm skipping. I'm, I'm I'm racing ahead because we still have to get to the 1781 stuff. So at at um after you know you got the river forts and and the fighting outside of Philadelphia and all that and then essentially Washington in December after White Marsh decides to um, keep the army together this year and instead of spreading them out like he did the year before uh, in a one encampment at Valley Forge one main encampment and so uh, you've all probably been to Valley Forge and of course when you go there. And you take the, the car tour right after the visitor center, bam, you're right there at Muhlenberg's, uh, Muhlenberg's Brigade. Um, now, what is the, the amazing thing about all of these, these uh, unit positions is how small these units got during Valley Forge. I mean, a brigade's supposed to have four regiments. That would be 2,800 men or so at full strength. And they shrunk down to just a couple hundred. The whole brigade shrunk, shrunk down. Now, General Muhlenberg actually was not at Valley Forge for the first couple of months. Um, soon after they picked that site and when they started building the huts and all that, Muhlenberg got permission to uh, join his wife and their uh, young son who had come up from Virginia to be with family in Pennsylvania. And so Muhlenberg now is gonna accompany them back to uh, Virginia, back to Dunmore County. Um, and so he does that and returns to Valley uh, Forge in March. Uh, there is uh, a reference uh, on the trip of him nearly losing his life by falling into the Susquehanna River, uh, I guess falling through ice or something. Um, and he might've even been a little bit ill from that because uh, I think he was delayed. He was traveling with a, with a Lieutenant Colonel named R uh, Richard Campbell, um, who ha also happened to be from Dunmore County and they, they were friends and such. So um, then what after, he, he does, show up in like the general orders at the Valley Forge and starts uh, kind of exercising authority um, in March and April and May. And then they march out in June. He is, his, his unit is essentially held in reserve during the Battle of Monmouth. They don't, they don't see a lot of fighting at Monmouth. And to really make things uh, flow, I do have to talk about the rank thing, but the next couple of years is, is, is not a whole lot of major activity uh, for any of the army after Mo uh, Northern Army. There is a very interesting thing with rank though. Rank was incredibly important to these guys. Very, very important. And if you were in any way slighted over, over um, the hierarchy of rank, it was considered a stain on your honor. And so what happened is General Woodford. William Woodford had been essentially the second in command in Virginia. First it was Patrick Henry, then first Colonel, and then he basically quit under under kind of a protest because he felt he got slighted. And then Woodford got passed over by two other experienced uh, officers, Hugh Mercer and Adam Stevens. Now these two guys had a lot of a lot more French and Indian War experience than Woodford. So Congress picked them and they jumped over Woodford. So Woodford resigned and he immediately regretted it because now four months later he's he's named a brigadier general, but he ends up going to the back of the line. Uh, he's the fourth general instead of he should have been the first brigadier general um but now he's the number four of, of the virginia generals well he starts complaining and he happens to have a very good friend and a very powerful man named edmund pendleton here in virginia and um 
they work and work and work. And before you know it, Congress starts asking Washington to, you know, do something about this. And Washington's just, ugh, these disputes drove him absolutely crazy. And so when it all gets settled, Woodford is given his position again. And George Whedon resigned. He's at a home in, in Virginia during Valley Forge when this happens and doesn't even come back. And Muhlenberg threatens to resign, actually says he's going to resign. But this is where character comes in because he doesn't. He doesn't resign because he realizes he's needed. And basically, he tells General Washington, there's a letter, uh, we've got a letter where he says, you know, I'll, I'll do it when, when it's convenient for the army. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to leave, leave you in the lurch, is basically. And so two years go by before uh, the issue really comes up again. And when it comes up again, it comes up in, 17, in late 1779, when the entire Virginia line is ordered south. And Woodford basically, now there's only two brigadier generals left. It's Woodford and, um, and um, Muhlenberg. I should, I'm wrong. General Scott is around too, but he's down in the south. And so literally Muhlenberg, you just see uh, General Muhlenberg, I will not serve under that man. Because Muhlenberg, I mean, sorry, General Woodford is going to lead the entire Virginia line down to the south. Muhlenberg refuses to go. And this is where it looks like he's definitely going to um, gonna, um, quit. Um, and instead, uh, an arrangement is made to have him go to Virginia and try to work on recruiting the strength. OK, OK, now I'm going to take another pause because I feel like I've been really rambling and I don't know what. Yeah, we're getting close. So um, do I have any questions? Yes, there are three questions. Okay. Um, the first one, um, was there, are you aware of a reaction from his father and family on his um, becoming an Anglican minister? Great question and I'm not aware of it. And I don't, but I don't think it was a, was an issue. Um, I mean, it was, it was a real, it was a practical move Oh boy, I would love to know the answer to that. Yeah, I'm sure there probably is because his father, there's a lot of written material on his father out there, uh, including a journal. Um, so uh, that'd be something I want to go and check out now, but I, I don't know. Uh, you, you, the, getting these really good questions, uh, I mean, I'm sorry I can't answer them. I know, but, I'm thinking about, uh, I'm thinking of looking that one up tomorrow myself because we yeah, have a journal. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I never, I, I don't get any sense that anybody objected to that. Um, they really objected. I know his brother um, objected to him being involved in the politics, the magistrate office and the political aspect. He thought, you know, you got to pick one or the other. You can't serve both. But in terms of the Anglican thing, great question. Sorry. Wish I knew. Um, and the next question asks, so the 8th Virginia German regiment, is that the same as the German regiment now in the Continental Line? Yeah, yes and no. It gets very confusing because apparently Maryland had a German regiment too. And I wouldn't be surprised if Pennsylvania did um, as well. And so it, it is very confusing of which German regiment you're talking about. That's why at some point the whole system starts to break down and it's, it's just impossible to even start telling, calling them by numbers anymore. You just got to see who the, who the colonel is to figure it out. So um it, it depends. I'll say for that one is it, it really depends. There were several German regiments from different uh, colonies, or I should say, states. Now, so it all depends on um, where the, the specific situation that you're asking about. And we have one more. Did Peter have children? You mentioned one so far. And yeah. if so, did they? Did the family follow him in his travels? No, not not the way you find uh, camp followers at reenactments and such that, that that do that, or you know, in in the war itself, he didn't. I and mean, you know, Mrs. Washington, of course, is famous for spending every um, year in in a winter when they went into winter quarters. She joined General Washington in camp every year, but uh, Mrs. Muhlenberg didn't do that ever. And as far as children, they had one. When, by the time he went into Valley Forge, and then when he accompanied her back, um, when he leaves, another one will be on the way. If you know what I mean? <laughs> so um, they, they have one of, uh, about nine months after his departure from, um, from Virginia that time. All right, now we get into the kind of the last phase, and this is the 1780-81 phase. Now, what, Muhlenberg is in Virginia, and he's basically... Um, 
trying to recruit, but it's hard to recruit in 1780. You know, every it's been a lot longer. All wars go a lot longer than anybody anticipates or expects. And so it's it's just really tough. And then the entire uh, Southern army is captured at Charleston, including the bulk of the Virginia Continental Line. Not all of them, but I'll, I'll, you know, most of the of the troops. So now you got to pick up the pieces from that. And in Muhlenberg is the natural choice. He's the ranking officer now left because Woodford is captured and will eventually die um, uh, before he's even released. General Charles Scott was the other brigadier that was still around in Virginia line. He's captured. Uh, he had already gone down to Charleston before Woodford did. So Muhlenberg is um, busy recruiting. And then at the very end of 1780, General uh, 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 Baron von Steuben shows up and he's a higher rank. He's a major general, so he takes charge. So the two of them work together. And in fact, when Steuben shows up in December, Muhlenberg finally gets a chance to go home. You know, he's been so busy kind of riding a circuit going from different outposts in Virginia uh, trying to raise men. Um, and the Virginia legislature has just uh, ordered a draft and all that. And so Muhlenberg's trying to get these guys organized. Now Steuben's there in Richmond. Richmond's the new capital. They moved it from Williamsburg in 79. And so um, Muhlenberg basically is like, okay, you got this, I'm going home. And literally, as he gets home to Dunmore County, now it's called Shenandoah County by that, and they, they changed the name, Benedict Arnold shows up. Benedict Arnold, the traitor, had betrayed us in, in the fall of 80, and he sent down to Virginia with a, with a detachment uh, or expedition of about, uh, I think, 1,600 men. And he sails right up the James River, um, and essentially then lands and marches to Richmond and, and loots Richmond and burns some buildings in Richmond. And basically he's just marching through this part of Virginia without any, any serious opposition. And so Muhlenberg quickly sends a message to, um, I'm sorry, Steuben sends a message to Muhlenberg, we need you, come back. So I think he got to spend three days, three days with his family before he jumps on a horse and rides as fast as he can to Fredericksburg. And, 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 you know, he's not even sure what's going on. And he, by the time he gets down to what's called Cabin Point, which is down here on, on the south side of the James River, Arnold has marched back to Portsmouth and kind of encamped. That's where he's going to stay because he was told to, you know, raid and pillage and all that. And then set up a, a naval position, um, a, a sturdy naval post. So that's a close up of, of that. And so what happens in January and February and early March is a, a very fascinating, a very interesting kind of game of, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a waiting game, but also a probing game. So you've got Muhlenberg over here in places like Suffolk. There's where Suffolk is. And you got to remember, unlike today where we can overcome bad terrain and, and ravines and, and all that, their roads are laid out largely based on the terrain. So if you've got a swamp, you go around that swamp. And so going straight to Portsmouth is really not an option. Um, the way it is today and do a straight drive because there's a lot of swampy area here. And so uh, what happens is th this map doesn't show the, the curvy roads as much, but you can get close to Portsmouth and, and, and Muhlenberg did. He had a number of troops, mostly militia, I should add. He's, he's a continental officer, but he's commanding mostly militia troops. Steuben's up in, um, in um, what is the barracks in what we call Chesterfield County with a few hundred, because that's the other part of the story I, I forgot to mention. There's still a war going on in, in the Carolinas, and General Nathaniel Green is begging for reinforcements. He needs them because he's trying to rebuild the Southern Army. So Virginia's trying to do two things now. They're trying to, to supply the, the Southern Army under Green with new men and supplies and fend off Arnold. Well, luckily, Arnold's not very active. Uh, so now we go to a point where Muhlenberg's hoping to bag Arnold. How great will that be if he's able to get him? And then General Lafayette shows up. And it looks like everything's on track to, uh, to attack and, and, um, and capture Benedict Arnold and punish him for his treachery. And then bam, a British uh, naval force shows up and then reinforcements follow. And so Arnold escapes. And before you know it, they're sailing up the river, the James River. Now we get into April, they land at Williamsburg and they keep going up. Muhlenberg is now marching and marching, kind of shadowing, going up. And they end up at a little place called Blanford uh, outside of Petersburg, where this really unfair fight breaks out between 2,500 men under General William Phillips 
of British, uh, Arnold's up there with that, and a thousand militia under Steuben and Muhlenberg. Now, Steuben is probably not right there engaged. He's probably back here across the Appomattox River. But Muhlenberg, I believe, was right there in the thick of the fight. And, the, and although there's not a lot of casualties, um, the militia, which is kind of a rare thing when, you, when I, I'm about to say, acquitted themselves very well. They fought well. And Muhlenberg, uh, there's a neat little quote from, um, from Steuben complimenting Muhlenberg for, for the action and his bravery and all. Okay, then what happens is General Lafayette with troops shows up. See, the first time he showed up, he kind of came down um, by boat uh, very quickly down the Chesapeake and landed. Uh, but his troops that were with him, light infantry, were left behind. Now he's bringing them all down um, and he's got like a thousand men, 900 men. And so he takes over. Steuben is actually kind of falling out of favor because uh, of incidents. He's not getting along with the, uh, with the government and all that. He's desperately trying to go out of Virginia to the Carolinas. You got all that <laughs> Carolina fighting still, Guilford Courthouse and all that. And now Peter Muhlenberg is placed in charge of Continentals. They basically the troops that Lafayette brought down, Muhlenberg commands uh, the best light infantry. They're, they're the select. And so now we get it as kind of May and June, which is hot down here in Virginia, just like it is in Pennsylvania. Um, and there's a game of cat and mouse when General Cornwallis shows up with the remnants of his army in Carolina. He merges them with Arnold's and with Phillips. And now you got 7,000 Brits in, in Virginia. And what do you have facing him? You got Lafayette. Well, and now you got Muhlenberg's got Lafayette's light infantry of 1,000. And you got militia, which come and go, and they're not very reliable. So Lafayette cannot stand and fight. So what happens is this, you look closely, you find this map in the Library of Congress um, uh, website there. Where's my cursor there? It and it's just this game of chase. They go all the way up uh, to uh, about 100 miles to Fredericksburg. Uh, and what, what's going on is, Lafayette won't fight the British and Cornwallis, and he's hoping that General Anthony Wayne from Pennsylvania will show up and reinforce him and turn the table. What, what happens eventually is uh, Cornwallis gives up, gives up the chase, and redirects his forces over to Charlottesville, almost captures uh, Governor Thomas Jefferson, um, does capture uh, an important supply depot at a place called Point of Forks. Then he marches back down toward Williamsburg, because he's kind of disconnected from his commander, General Henry Clinton in New York. And so he needs to find out. It's been months since he's heard uh, yeah, any orders or any information. So he's heading back down toward the James River so he can then probably get information that's been sent to Portsmouth. Well, while he's there, a couple of battles break out. One, this is only six miles from Colonial Williamsburg called Spencer's Ordinary. Muhlenberg is not involved in it, although um, General Wayne, no, Wayne's at Green Spring. Um, some some of the light luck it's the dragoons actually and and, and the riflemen um are involved in spencer's ordinary and then green spring green spring is an amazing battle that's happened right right over at jamestown if you ever go to jamestown and this is a fantastic map of it and again muhlenberg's you know there in reserve but he doesn't actually get to fight at green spring that was uh, all of general um anthony wayne's Pennsylvanians who had joined them in June. Okay, let's get to the really last one. And that's Yorktown. Because after Cornwallis gets his orders, he, he basically is told to find a, a place to, to create a winter harbor, so to speak, a safe harbor for the British Navy. He decides Portsmouth's not good uh, and, and he, he picks Yorktown. So he takes his men and he, and he go, gets there in August and he slowly you know, entrenches and all that. He's not that worried put some forces over here just um, because it's, it's vulnerable. And then everything falls into place. The French Navy and the French, they refuse to help uh, General Washington attack New York, but they say, oh, by the way, we're sending our Caribbean fleet up to the Chesapeake uh, and get out get away from the hurricanes down there for a couple of months. You can use them. And then Washington goes, oh, wait. So I got some troops in Virginia, but not enough. But those, that, those French, the French Navy has Marines and I've got troops up here. If I can get them down, and that's exactly what happens. Everybody converges on Yorktown, and the British totally bungle uh, bungle things. You know, Henry Clinton first is unaware, and then even when he's aware, um, he doesn't really 
put a lot of urgency into, into um, saving Cornwallis. The British Navy drops the ball, gets chased away. And so you got that, uh, you got basically the Battle of Cornwallis. Now, what did Muhlenberg do there? He's commanding General Lafayette's light infantry, which means he's over here. He's over here on the right flank. This is actually a better map. So he's over here and you can go and walk the walk this area. It's uh, it's Lafayette, I'm sorry, it's some of Muhlenberg's troops are involved in Alexander Hamilton's assault on redoubt number 10 um, that, that fateful night. And so, you know, the siege goes on for three weeks and all that. Um, and when it's over and then at the surrender, Muhlenberg is exhausted because uh, he's been on the road all this uh, time um, under different commanders. And he immediately, he actually gets sick. He comes down and is feeling very ill, probably the malaria come flailing up again. And once the British have been captured and all and everything's kind of settled, he asks permission to uh, return home. And I wanted to share with you the letter he wrote to Washington. Um, now, poor General Washington was dealing with his own personal crisis, probably happened after this letter though, where his um, this last surviving stepchild um, passes away, gets sick and dies of camp fever. Um, but this is what, no, that's not. Give me one second, I know we're running maybe a little bit long. Um, okay, listen to this letter. I think this is kind of a telling letter. He writes to General Washington kind of to support his application to leave and return home on a furlough. He says, your ex excellency will please remember that I had obtained permission to visit my family in the spring of 1779 but was prevented by General Woodford's remaining longer in Virginia than was expected. In November 79, I obtained your excellency's permission again, but was stopped in Philadelphia by the Board of War when the Virginia line was ordered to Charleston. Since that time, I obtained permission from St General Steuben to go home for a time, but had been there only three days when I was recalled by express at the time when Arnold invaded the state. So what he's saying in that letter is, sir, I've been home for three days in the last two and a half years. Can I please go home? And he does. He does. And he regains his strength and all that. And he remains in the army. Um, he remains there until the end. Uh, he ends up as he's still a brigadier general because there's really no room to, uh, to, um, to uh, be promoted. But then Congress passes kind of a thank you and says, uh, whatever rank you are as for the officers, whatever rank you are at the end of the war when the P Treaty of Paris is signed, you jump one more rank. So he ends up retiring from the army as a major general, right? Now he goes back uh, home and quickly decides I cannot return to the church after what I've been through. It's just not right. It's not in me. I'm not going to do it. So he moves to Pennsylvania within uh, a couple of years. And um, here's an interesting thing. I love this. This is my last quote and this pretty much wraps it up. He, uh, in, in the early 1780s, he, um, he granted land. You remember that was one of the ways they paid for the soldiers with large land grants. So he's, he's granted thousands of acres of land. And he, he goes out to the West to check them out. And he, he writes his humorous account um, about him. He's standing in a tavern and he's listening to people in Pennsylvania probably talk about old Muhlenberg, right? Now remember, he was 29 when this thing started. So it's only been, he's only in his mid thirties now. So this is what he writes. He says, I stand by incognito and hear the name Muhlenberg made use of sometimes in one way and sometimes in another. For were I known, I believe no one would have the hardiness to mention that name with disrespect. In other words, nobody knows I'm Muhlenberg, but if they knew it was me, they wouldn't be talking like this. And look at me for I have at present the perfect resemblance of Robinson Caruso four belts around me, two brace of pistols, a sword and rifle slung, besides my pouch and tobacco pipe, which is not a small one. Add to this the blackness of my face, which occasions the inhabitants to take me for a traveling Spaniard. And I am sure that my appearance alone ought to protect me from both politics and insult. Well, it doesn't protect him from politics because he basically um, embraces a career in politics for the rest of his life including state politics. I think he was essentially the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. They had a different title for it then, but Vice President of Virginia under Benjamin Franklin, I read. Um, he also serves the House, uh, House of Representatives and briefly in the US Senate, ends up uh, in a more lucrative job, probably the Port Inspector of Philadelphia. Um, and um, that's what he was doing and, until he, he passes away in 1807. I think he was uh, 60, 60 years old, maybe 61. Uh, it's on his birthday, but. We can figure that out. 
And there you have it. That's that's my presentation on General John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. Oh, 801. <laughs> Very good. Um, we do have two questions um, right now in the chat. Um, the first one is, George III was a Hanoverian king, and the British mm. obtained military aid from a half dozen German principalities. Mm. Did the Muhlenbergs or others within German-speaking communities feel undue pressure to prove their patriotism? No, I, I, I'd never come across anything like that. Um, I, I just, I don't think so. Um, it's not brought up. I, there was a little bit of prejudice against guys like like um, Hugh Mercer for being an upper Britain, a Northern Britain, which is another word for Scotsman. So uh, there, there's a little bit of a, a, a angst about the Scots, but I don't think that was ever an issue. Um, um, not, not, I've never come across it, so no. That's something that we ask about all the wars for the, the German speaking, the Pennsylvania Dutch yeah. people around that region. We kind of look at that throughout the world wars as well. There's another question here. Um, Edward uh, Duckman Muhlenberg was an artillery commander during the American Civil War and he has a plaque at Gettysburg. The plaque is one of the first things you see when entering the park. Supposedly Edward is a relation of John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, but do either of you know how? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm focused so much on the military. I, I couldn't even tell you the names of his first two children. Um, I haven't been very helpful with these questions. I'm so sorry. Uh, um, I would say I, I do have lots of family trees at work. So if this was an anonymous question, but if anybody would like to ask some of these broader Muhlenberg family questions, um, feel, please feel free to email me as well. Um, and I'd be happy to, uh, happy to address those. So I think, um, is, does anybody have other questions this evening? We'd be happy to take one or two more. Um, there are any. It is very strange doing this without having any kind of, that you can't read your audience at all. I hope it went well. well um, okay. All right, there don't seem to be any, um, any new ones. Um, Mike, this was fantastic. Um, and I'm excited from what I got out of it to expand upon upon this one member of, of the Muhlenberg family. Um, so thank you so much for doing this. And again, I would encourage everybody in the chat, there's a link to the Amazon um, uh, ability to purchase the book. So if you're interested in reading more about it, um, I definitely encourage you. I did, and I thought it was wonderful. So um, I encourage you to as well. Thank you very much. Well, I hope you all enjoyed the evening. And in closing, I want to extend an, a, a sincere thank you to Susan and Mike and all the Valley, Valley Forge Park Alliance volunteers who made this evening possible. And thank you for participating in the discussion tonight. I hope you'll join us on December 1st for Pox Americana, the great smallpox epidemic of 1775 to 82 with Elizabeth Fenn, Pulitzer Prize winner, and distinguished professor at University of Colorado Boulder. And lastly, thank you Valley Forge Park Alliance members for your wonderful support of Valley Forge. Truly, you make our mission possible every day. Thank you. And with that, I wanna wish everybody a very good night from Valley Forge. Stay well and hope to see you in December. Thanks. Good night.